Good afternoon and welcome to Match of the Day and we're back to League Football again. In the second division we assess whether Sheffield Wednesday away at Middlesbrough, or someone else for that matter, can stop Fulham, Queen's Park Rangers and Wolves running away with the promotion race. And in the first division we ask, are Liverpool, who play West Bromwich Albion at the Hawthorns, home and dry? And if not, what's the best way to set about beating them? This is what Albion manager Ron Wiley fought at 2.45 yesterday. Well, I think that uh, at the moment, as you can see from the combination of our team, we have three central defenders and uh, two attacking fullbacks. Because uh, Derek Statham is an attacking fullback and because Clive Whitehead is an ex outside right, both these fullbacks will be playing in midfield and otherwise they'll be in midfield in order to go forward and give us width and attack. Because at this club we don't have wingers. And so I've had to try and improvise a little bit by producing the two fullbacks into midfield in order to go forward. So I'm hoping to try and attack Liverpool. Today's news, Swansea City threatened to withdraw from membership of the Welsh FA. Kevin Keegan has some good news for Newcastle fans. And we look at this week's important quarterfinals in the... ...magic of Liverpool that they attracted the biggest crowd of the day, 24,560, to the Hawthorns. Not a huge crowd by some standards, but good for West Brom and sufficient to provide an electric atmosphere in keeping with the nature of the fixture and a rather special presentation taking place. Your commentator, John Motson. Two Albion players with special reason to celebrate today. Centre-half John Weil on the left is making his 600th league appearance and first he presents to Cyril Regis on behalf of the BBC the goal of the season trophy for 1981-82. And that silver salver will be a permanent reminder to Cyril of the goal he scored here in the FA Cup last season against Norwich. Here's Robertson. Regis taking it well on the chest and a lovely piece of control by Regis. Oh, and what a great shot! Oh, one of the goals of the season! Indeed it was, and today Regis hopes to score against Liverpool for the third season running at the Hawthorns. He's one of five players in the Albion lineup who missed the 2-0 defeat at Anfield on the opening day of the season. Derek Statham, John Weil and Gary Owen were all absent, and just recently Albion have signed a new goalkeeper in Paul Barron. Liverpool, beaten only once in 18 matches, keep the same side, with Ronnie Whelan returning as substitute. Ian Rush, with 23 goals, has been making headlines, but what about Kenny Dalglish's recent record? 16 goals in his last 16 matches, and a grand total in his career of 299 in competitive club football with Celtic and Liverpool. And what will happen this afternoon tactically is that Albion will try and play with three centre-backs, Robertson, Weil and Bennett, in the hope of containing Hodgson and Rush, and they'll push their full-backs with Albion, Whitehead and Statham, into midfield. Wide positions, they hope, will be an attacking platform. In the meantime, it's Gary Owen and an offside against Peter Risto. Used to play for a Merseyside club. Risto, who came from Everton in exchange for Andy King at the beginning of the season. And this well-oiled Liverpool side attacking on four fronts in 1983. The league and three cups. Hodgson fed forward to him again. Alan Kennedy is well forward here. Referee this afternoon is Tom Bune from Newbury. On by Owen, Regis chasing, back by Lawrence. That was Whitehead. Used to be an outside right at Bristol City, so he'll want to get forward when he can. Rush, Dalglish, good turn, a little chip. Could have caught Baron off his line, and that's where Dalglish is so sensitive to what's on. To score that number of goals in your career, you have to be able to take opportunities from all angles. And he just sensed there that Baron might have been slightly off his line and tried the delicate chip. to Neil and away by Wilde 
touch by Johnston was not accurate. So Owen pushes one forward, but offside was given against a combination of Regis and Zondervan. Sunis, the Liverpool captain. Good tackle by Joe. Bennett, Owen. Regis wants it played now. Oh, well intercepted by Lawrenson. That was a fine piece of defending, and it may have gone unnoticed by many in the crowd. Instead, here's Lee. What a good effort, and turned over by Paul Barron. Sammy Lee, who had the shot. But the move started because Lawrenson intercepted almost casually a ball that would have put Cyril Regis on his way to goal at the other end. Brilliant play by Liverpool. Johnston with the flick on, and the header coming in from David Hodgson. Zondervan to Easto, Regis in the centre. Didn't run for him. It ran out of Lawrence. Whitehead with the throw. Alan Kennedy with the interception. Good turn by Whitehead. Then it was Owen looking for Zondervan. He used some pace there, but the cross was longish for Regis. It'll find Staden. Bit tight for Joe, but a good layoff to Robertson. Here's Owen. Zondervan. in again by Joe Owen Zondervan good turn and away by Lawrence trying to curl the ball into the near post for the big fellows who'd come forward. So half an hour gone here at the Hawthorns. Liverpool setting up play again in the Albion half. Where they've got uh, seven players pushed forward, one of them being Alan Kennedy, who's now in the outside left position. Soon as on that side as well. Off Bennett. Hodgson competing, so is Dalgleish. Owen. Regis, good turn. And good ball. Statham, can he go all the way, Derek Statham? Well, there's Ron Wiley's plan paying off to make the fullbacks into attacking midfield players. Cyril Regis with the initial turn and delivery, and beautifully done it was. Statham, who had the confidence and the strength to run on, and the shot wide of Grobelaar's right-hand post. Joe. And Grobelaar's got all the way to meet Zondervan and lost him. And there's a chance in the middle here. And can Regis finish it off? He's hit the post. Easto couldn't get the rebound. Can Statham do something? Robert
Robertson. And Easto sets one up, and Robertson comes through again. And what an extraordinary piece of goalkeeping by a man who almost came to Albion when he was 15 years old, Bruce Grobelar. He was here on trial. And back at the Hawthorns today, he went all the way out to meet Zondervan on the right, missed him, Zondervan got the ball in, but Regis, having to beat a defender in the challenge, hit the post. Well, there is still a feeling that uh, Grobelar has his more eccentric moments. He's a fine goalkeeper in the making, he's made some splendid saves this season, but a rush of blood just occasionally can make the Liverpool defenders ask themselves exactly what's happening. And Joel wins out against Dalglish. Gets a return from Gary Owen. Checks because Zondervan was trying to avoid being offside. He's not now, and Grobola has to come and meet him rather more firmly this time. The Liverpool goalkeeper has to be the sweeper the way they play. And Zondervan now twice has been the Albion player who's broken through. And somebody's spoken, I think it's Kenny Dalglish speaking out of order to the referee and he's being booked. There was a tackle just a few minutes ago by Joel on Dalgleish, which set up that last move where I think Dalgleish thought he'd been fouled. The referee let play go. May have been that that Dalgleish was contesting. Hodgson with Bennett and then with Owen. Shook them both off. Dalglish, Hodgson. Rush. Dalglish. Well, Paul Barron getting behind everything so far. Looking very comfortable. Owen forward. scored in all their home matches this season but in the first half here Liverpool had the greatest share of play the most interesting incident happening though at the Liverpool end when the goalkeeper Bruce Grobelar was out of his ground having come to meet Romeo Zondervan the sparkling new main grandstand at the Hawthorns which cost two and a half million pounds and which is Albion are proud to say completely paid for among the VIPs in there today, the England manager, Bobby Robson. Liverpool, the highest scorers in the league with 58 goals, but uh, Albion have only lost one match here at the Hawthorns this season. That was to West Ham way back in September. Here's Rush for Liverpool. And Hodgson's going through there dangerously. Bennett went across. And tricked Lee very nicely. Found Derek Statham, who in turn found Regis. Easto is offside. Joe Fagan tipped by many as the next boss at Anfield. Dalgleish. was right on the edge, says the referee. Dalglish is pointing, saying to the linesman, that was inside. The referee has gone to have a look. Martin Joel will be relieved if he goes to the position where he pointed, which he has. And that award has been given outside the area, much to the distaste of the Liverpool players. It could still be dangerous, nonetheless. gesture towards the crowd by Dalglish who feels he was wronged left for Lee to float one and Joel to clear with a header Lee again Johnston Clear foul by Johnston on Gary Owen. 
little bit of frustration creeping in on Liverpool's part, having been denied the penalty that they appealed for. Five minutes gone in the second half, and no score. Neil. Dalglish. restless as Liverpool build up with Rush, Hodgson, Rush again, appeals by Albion, and here's Craig Johnston. Well, Ian Rush working the move in the first place with David Hodgson, Paul Barron down, not able to hold, and Craig Johnston coming in, but unable to turn the ball into the net from that angle. Pisto was fouled by Lawrenson. <laughs> Lawrenson's header out. Hodgson didn't make it. Joel did. Bennett. Regis. Whitehead. Easto coming near post. Could be dangerous this. Well, Grobelard did awfully well. Peter Easto sneaking in behind the defence as Whitehead put the perfect ball in and Grobelard coming to meet the Albion man certainly put him off sufficiently to prevent Liverpool going a goal down. Wasn't so much a save as an intervention but a very important one. Robillard perhaps atoning for that one moment of uh, carelessness in the first half. Oh, good running by Lawrence and onto the free kick from Sunis. I was talking to Rob Paisley about Mark Lawrence and before the match today, and he made the point that when he bought him, he bought more than just one player. He bought a man who can fill in to so many positions. And there are people who will tell you that Lawrenson ranks among the most complete players in Britain. Stay them. They want it played early, but they might get caught offside. He's gone alone. Joel. Owen. And now Bennett. Lifts one in for Easto. Can Regis make it? Neil could. And this could be dangerous for Albion. Liverpool have four against three. Lee plays it to Hodgson. Who takes on Wilde. And Sunis. Well saved by Baron. Albion looked like losers there in that Liverpool attack. They were a man short at the start. The build-up was good, and Sunas found a very forward position. Dalglish. Here's Kennedy. And away by Joel. Offside. And 24 and a half thousand people who've come here today sensing that this match is still perfectly balanced. Easto knocking one back. Owen. Statham is well forward. Well, that's a bit rough. Lawrence, free kick. He said he won the ball, but the man went down in the same movement. The man indeed was Easto. Well, 
They've pushed Bennett forward. They've pushed Wilde forward. to chip one but that's no chance at all from an Albion point of view because it was much too long Ridges had come in too far perhaps but here's Sunis and now Liverpool on the break with four up Kenny Dalglish look at the number of red shirts around here Hodgson Lee and Hodgson oh, the best move of the match Certainly the most penetrating and the closest we've come to a goal. Liverpool came out of defence there and got seven red shirts in the Albion half in next to no time. Sammy Lee played the final ball in. Hodgson volleyed. It looked from this angle as though it might go in. In fact, it went outside the post. Regis. into Johnston may run for Sunis Hodgson rushes hovering inside the area and he's there and Ian Rush and that's Liverpool they don't mind if they score in the first middle or the last they'll get there in the end and we were just into injury time when Ian Rush put the ball in the net for his 24th Liverpool goal of the season and Joe Fagan just checks the watch and the Liverpool supporters see their side turn what appeared to be a certain goalless draw into what looks like now another three-point performance by the Champions and League leaders and it was virtually the last kick and how many times have Liverpool done it Bill Shankly always used to say the match lasts 90 minutes plus what the referee adds on. And right at the very end, Paul Barron beaten by Ian Rush. Albion beaten at home for only the second time this season. And the question remains unanswered. Who now can stop Liverpool? Well, first of all, John, congratulations on your 600th league appearance. It's never nice to lose on an occasion like that, but... Uh... It's the old question, really. What is the senior professional's view on why Liverpool keep on doing it? Uh, well, it, it seems very, very easy. Having played against them ten years ago, the, uh, it's still the same Liverpool machine doing the same things as they were doing then. And uh, I think, really, there isn't any great secret to them because they preach simplicity, and that's how they play it. They, they never try to do anything difficult unless they're around the box. And certainly the front players are well capable of doing it when they get in there. But um, I think they have a, a faith in their, in their method and they won't be altered by um, other people's views. I think there was a time when people were very critical of them being a dull side. But I think they've come through that and they're now a very attractive side who uh, are confident. And um, this continuity, I think it breeds confidence. And certainly you see new players coming in. As I said, it really is the same team which was playing for Liverpool 10 years ago with just a, a set of different players. Um, but because they, of their simple method, the new players coming in just seem to adapt very, very quickly and easily. Um, Is that because some of the older players and the star names are asked to do just as much hard work <clears throat> as the newcomers? Yes, I think, uh, I think they've, they've, they've certainly put the, the team effort before anything else, which I think is um, a big compliment. And I, certainly good players who are are humble enough to sacrifice their own game for the team benefit. I think that is a sign of a very, very good player. Uh, but it's also the sign of a very, very good staff. And um, 
When you talk about Liverpool, I think you, you must look at the people behind the scenes because they must have a tremendous influence on the players. And certainly the players do as they're told, or appear to be so anyway. And that is their strength. An interesting view of Liverpool there from a man who should know. Outstanding players unselfishly sublimating their skills to the needs of the team. And there are those who claim that method football suppresses flair, and those who think that to put too great a belief in carefree skills costs goals and points. Well, the answer, it seems, is in finding the perfect balance. Do it in the right place at the right time, and afterwards, however many international caps you've earned, accept with humility the boss's verdict. Well, West Bromwich Albion were a bit unlucky in the end to get away with nothing. But if ever a game which was far from a classic owed something to three points for a win, that one did. Whatever the problems they had in coping with a strong wind over 90 minutes, in the closing stages, both teams went flat out for a knockout, which at least kept the game alive until the final whistle. Apart from a seemingly unassailable 10-point lead in the championship, Liverpool are also chasing the European Cup, the FA Cup and the Milk Cup. It's that last competition which Liverpool, the holders of course, now turn their attention to because on Tuesday they meet West Ham in one of the quarter-final ties. It's a repeat of the final two seasons ago which went to a replay after a one-all draw at Wembley. And in the second game at Villa Park, Liverpool came from behind to win 2-1 with Kenny Dalglish getting a marvellous equaliser. Well, it's the West Ham crowd who are singing. But all credit to Liverpool, they haven't been put out of their stride either by the goal or being denied by the woodwork twice. Here's McDermott, back to his old sharpness. And I must say, Rush is giving the side nice balance. And here's Dalglish! Oh, that's a marvellous goal! Really a classic goal from Dalglish. Today's team news for the Liverpool-West Ham tie, Bob Paisley told me that he has no injury problems and that he's likely to feel the side which beat Albion. West Ham manager John Lyle is not quite so certain of his lineup. Ray Stewart had one stitch inserted in a cut on the instep after yesterday's game at Nottingham Forest. But as long as there's no swelling or discomfort, he should be OK, as should Francois van der Elst, who twisted a knee during the same game. Both Alvin Martin and Paul Goddard, who returned to the team yesterday, came through without further problems. The other All-First Division quarter-final takes place on Wednesday. Manchester United against Nottingham Forest, which could attract an enormous crowd to Old Trafford, most of whom will be hoping United gain revenge for the defeat Forrest inflicted upon them in the FA Cup fourth round two seasons ago, the last time the clubs met in cup competition. Burns has come forward. And Jordan, number nine, there has come back with him. And Bailey in trouble, and it's gone in, and Francis gets the credit. For Wednesday's game, United's manager, Ron Atkinson, reports no injuries and expects to field the side which won at Birmingham yesterday. Nottingham Forest have two problems. On the injury front, Gary Bertels has a leg injury which might prevent him from playing against the club he left only a few months ago. And Viv Anderson could return for his first senior match since dislocating a knee. That really depends on whether Kenny Swain, whose loan period at Forest is up, can sort out a couple of problems tomorrow morning with Aston Villa manager Tony Barton and agree to the personal terms offered to him, which would ensure a permanent transfer. Terms are agreed between the clubs. The other tie to be played on Wednesday evening is Spurs against Burnley. Spurs' main injury worry is Gary O'Reilly, who's doubtful with a shoulder injury. Graham Roberts also had treatment this morning for a calf problem, but is likely to play. For Burnley, Martin Dobson, the club's captain, who's been injured since New Year's Day, resumes full training tomorrow and would love to play, but may not have recovered sufficient match fitness to be risked. The one tie we've not mentioned so far is Arsenal against Sheffield Wednesday. That takes place at Highbury on Tuesday evening. Terry Neal will pick the Arsenal side from the 12 which beat Stoke yesterday, plus Stuart Robson, who is available after suspension. Vladimir Petrovic, who scored yesterday, is now eligible for the competition. And Captain David O'Leary, who was pulled off as a precautionary measure, should be fit. There are no problems reported from the Wednesday camp. The Arsenal Wednesday clash evokes memories of a famous previous cup encounter, that epic four seasons ago in the FA Cup, when Arsenal eventually won in the fifth meeting 2-0. The decisive goal coming from Frank Stapleton. And a big night coming up for Sheffield Wednesday at Highbury on Tuesday. But yesterday at Middlesbrough, their thoughts were on staying in the promotion race. They put themselves in danger of losing touch with the leaders, but Middlesbrough, in desperate need of points themselves, and buoyant from thwarting Bishop Stortford's brave challenge, were far from easy opponents. Your commentator, Barry Davis. It's a big day for 20-year-old Kellum O'Hanlon, 
born on Teesside, though of Irish parents, who gets his chance in the middle for a goal because the regular incumbent, Jim Platt, has gone down with measles. And the lineup in front of him on a very blustery afternoon shows one other change from the side which finally disposed of Bishop Stortford in the cup. Joe Bolton comes in at number three. Theories that Kevin Beatty was about to return have proved to be somewhat premature. Sheffield Wednesday also introduced a new face, Pat Hurd, signed from Aston Villa on Thursday. And he takes his place in the lineup, which finally ended a depressing sequence of nine matches without a league win when they beat Charlton by five goals to four. It's a return to Ayrston Park for number three, Ian Bailey. And also for Jack Charlton, who brings a team here for the first time since he himself was manager at Ayrston Park. Four years, 73 to 77, during which time he took them up to the first division. And the referee is Joe Worrell of Warrington. So away we go on the second half of the Football League season. Two teams met on the opening day at Hillsborough when Sheffield Wednesday in their usual stripes, then and now one by three goals to one. Cyril Knowles is the man in charge of Middlesbrough today, in the centre there. Malcolm Allison is watching Knox County play at Swansea. Knox County meet uh, Middlesbrough in the FA Cup here in the next round. Well collected by Bolton, but here's Megson. He gets himself into trouble needlessly. And that was a fair hoof. David Shearer. Well, Boulder, his last two league games. Are difficult ones. Eight goals conceded, a 4-1 defeat at Burnley, followed by the 5-4 victory against Charlton. Since when Wednesday have become embroiled in quite a contest with South End in the FA Cup. And by Bannister to Pearson. John Brownley. Their first touch for O'Hanlon. For those of a statistical bent, might like to know he becomes the 21st player for Middlesbrough to make his debut against Sheffield Wednesday. Goes back to 1904. Finds Otto. Change of the angle. Brownlee. The wind then worked against Middlesbrough, took it away from the head of Shearer and into the hands of Boulder. Bailey Megson well, He almost judged it well and the goalkeeper's out of his area So handball it was a well struck pass into the wind The goalkeeper had no chance of stopping himself so no question of that being a foul other than the obvious handball. The referee's done well, he's got the wall at 10 yards. And Smith strikes and slices. Scored against South End in midweek. From the moment the ball left his boot, then it was going wide. Auto. It's a good cross. And Lyons put out of harm's way. Beautifully clipped cross, which was curling away from a goalkeeper who knew he was battling on a losing course. Bell for Kennedy. It's a bit too strong for Baxter. It's Otto again. Brownlee, Sugru, the time to see who was around. And almost time for the shot, but not quite. Here's Wood, he didn't have time either. And again, Wood had taken a good forward position and really Middlesbrough ought to be seeing his movements better.
Sigru. Otto. Determination for the Dutchman. And finally, one of the several arm links produced the free kick. players in attacking positions. Shearer with the sharpness one might expect of a player who scored twice in midweek. Megson. And here's Shearer again. Said the wrong thing, didn't I? And he seemed to have got it under control. But, uh, the shot was a rather a flashy one, and he was leaning back, and the ball was high under the face of the roofing. Side. No, the flag stays down. Here's Megson. Well, he had so much time. Seemed to lack conviction. Well, I suppose it could be said we've had one clear-cut chance at either end. That one to Megson, and earlier an opportunity for David Shearer. Shearer. Also trying to find him again, but Shearer hadn't run on that angle. Grew. Wood in the middle, so Shearer. Bannister, who tried to wait for it to come down, and the goalkeeper did very well. And some good play by Bannister, who was prepared to take his time for the ball to drop where he wanted it to, and the goalkeeper across to palm it over the crossbar. And has made his mark in the match. Lions looking for the nod down. Go kick. Callum O'Hanlon has made his first save of note in league football. First time he's played in a competitive match in the first team. Smith. Straight at Lyons. Oh. Good top. Taylor. You wonder for a moment who's playing which way. Shelton. Brownlee, the bad pass. It's cut out three players. Brownlee taking full advantage. Well, he did until he tried to pass the ball. Did he ever make up his mind what he was going to do? He was given the freedom of a considerable area of the pitch. Otto, straight through Bailey. Unfortunate moment to stumble. 
Here's Wood. Crisp shot by Darren Wood. But curling away from the far post quite early on. right between the legs of the referee by Michael Kennedy. Wood's going to have a crack, I think. Yes, he is. Very good one, too. And the ball given away. This is Bell and Sagru missing the Gilded's chance. Side foot, so deliberate, but no pace. Boulder just fell on it in the sand. Baxter, Mason. Bell. Check of the watch. Will not, I think, detain the players much longer. Megson. Well watched by Natras. The win which has won too many of the contests of this opening half, which ends scoreless. Which will please at least one person, the new young goalkeeper, Callum O'Hanlon. This is the 14th match that Middlesbrough played since Malcolm Addison became their manager. Record so far showing three defeats, five wins and five draws. The league record, and of course they're in the fourth round of the FA Cup and a chance to remove a first division side in Notts County. Cyril Knowles looking for a goal, nice one or of any sort. Brownlee. Good play by Natchez. Knew where Bannister was. Bolton. Kennedy. Bell inside. Otto inside as well now. Smith in attendance. Kennedy has done well. Final header. Over the top. From Shearer. Touchline, figure six being shown, indicating that Heine Otto is to come off. Um, not a decision which the crowd approve of. And he's replaced by Ray Hankin. So it's a midfield player for a more forward player. The midfield player has gone off, the forward player has come off. I'm sure there he was. Just lobbed through and Bell with great confidence placing it away from Bob Boulder to get the home side the lead. Oh. 
74 minutes of the match gone. It was a long time, but it was a nice goal. Very well taken. Shed up. And Bell once more. Kennedy. Ball never moved. It was anchored by Taylor. And the referee feeling that Kennedy's action warranted the booking. Stephen Bell. 17 years old and that's his eighth goal of the season Bannister Bolton Sterling Timmins good save didn't quite get hold of it in the way that he would have liked but the shot lacked the power that it needed to get past the goalkeeper who got down quickly Gordon Owen to come on for Sheffield Wednesday to replace Kevin Taylor ten minutes left Sheffield Wednesday to improve a really depressing sequence away from home They took seven points out of 30 and finally got a victory in a curious and quite incredible game against Charlton, 5-4. Away from home, they just cannot score goals, it seems. They started the season so well in that department. Here's Wood for Middlesbrough. Bell. Clearance seeking out Owen. A handle makes his first mistake of the afternoon. A shrug of the shoulders of a somewhat continental style was his uh, only comment. Natchez, Brownlee having luck with the ricochet. Smith is on his own in the centre of the defence now with Lyons pushed further forward. Sterland. Now, can they exploit the gap that he's left? Shearer, he's got back very quickly, has the full back. With considerable fortune won the ball but gave it straight away to Kennedy. Pass was much too strong. Sheffield Wednesday involved still in two cup competitions. We play second replay against South End in the FA Cup. They go to Highbury to play Arsenal in the Milk Cup on Tuesday. But their promotion challenge, which is the main requirement, fading for the here's Shearer. He's not frightened in any way. Stephen Bell. That's a pass intended for Shearer to run onto. Going out to the left. Bannister and Baxter. A solid display, Baxter. 
but suddenly out of nothing Pearson scores and really they went to sleep from the throw-in Shelton who turned it on and Pearson finally ends a long drought to equalize at one all and really Middlesbrough will kick themselves and marking was non-existent Here's Wood. Staked by Hankin. Megson. Passed an awful lot. So that he looks it. On by Wood and well on to the Shearer. But the referee's whistle goes when we come to the end of a match which will be remembered by three youngsters but not by many other people. Stephen Bell, 17 years old, who scored the Middlesbrough goal, his third goal in consecutive Saturdays by John Pearson, 18 years old, who finally ended a scoring drought, his first goal since last September, and by the debutant goalkeeper, Kellum O'Hanlon, who for so long thought that his debut would be marked by a clean sheet. It wasn't, and the points are shared in a one-all draw. Jack, not easy to play football in a gale. No, it's the conditions made it very difficult. I think half the problems of our game at the moment, actually, are the balls we have to play with. You know, they never, they, they never stay any different. They whistle around in the wind, they're hard to control. In conditions like this, it's very difficult. What does a manager do when his side are in the sort of run that's your side? Is? Well, I was quite pleased with it today, actually. I thought our balance was much better than it's been. I thought we were a little bit inhibited in getting up to the support of our front two players. But we put that right, I think our balance is a bit better now. We seem to be coming out of the recession, as they say. We got a draw. I, I was sitting waiting for us to win the game, actually, because Middlesbrough in the second half, of course, there's no problems at all. And we looked as if any time we would get a goal. And then uh, we went to goal down with a foul. I mean, Hankin's foul was a, was a joke. Hankin, forward for Bell. Beautiful taken by Bell. Stephen, you must be enjoying life at the moment. It's been a pretty good spell for you. Yeah, well, I've started to knock a couple of goals in, but yet again, the we lost it in the last couple of minutes, as we've done a couple of times now, through the game away, through lack of um, thinking about it, you know. But we'll just have to keep going on and try and get a couple more wins under our belt. Tell us a bit about yourself. You're a local lad, aren't you? Yeah, well, I'm a look. I live about a mile away from the ground, and I started coming here when I was about 12 years old. And I signed when I was 14 years old as a schoolboy. At 16, I signed as an apprentice. And I've just got to sign a four-year contract as a professional at the club. You're 18, in fact, in March, is that right? Yeah, that's correct, 18 in March. And you're obviously a player who likes running with the ball. Oh, yeah, I think that's my main asset, running with the ball and taking players on. So I love to get the ball at my feet and run after people. Does Malcolm Anderson encourage you to do that? Oh, yeah, ever since he's came to the club, he's told us, you know, he says it doesn't matter if we lose the ball or anything, as long as we should prove, prove a positive attitude, you know, and he's not really bothered if we lose the ball. And goal scoring, presumably, is a bonus on top of that? Yeah, well, the first, I think it was about the first 15 games, I'd scored one or two goals. And then, the, as I say, the last five or six matches, I've put about five or six in. So it's starting to come right at the last. It was a nice ball played through to you by Ray Hankin. Oh, yeah, lovely ball. He, I think he chipped it over Ian Bailey, and I seen the keep just off his line. And I just tried to lob it over the top and luckily hit the back of the net. Disappointing result. I would rather have won or lost. You'd rather have won or lost? Won or lost, yeah. You know, I'd rather have won the game or lost it. You know, but because I, th I was trying to get our lads in the second half to get up and win it. And then uh, we finish up with a draw. This Middlesbrough no good, this is no good. But it means that you've had two league matches, one win and one draw, which is better than you've had in recent months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's the way the game is. You go through a little bit of bad time, your players lose a little bit of confidence. We've got good players, we know they can play. Uh, all they need is a couple of wins under the belt and who knows? Who knows indeed. And I must say that game too suffered as a result 
of the wind. Jackie's remarks about the ball set me wondering whether at some time in the future a slightly heavier ball might be used with benefit to all concerned under such conditions. Well, Jackie's attitude to winning and losing also emphasises the effect of that three-point win bonus. There's news today of the possibility of Swansea City withdrawing their membership of the Welsh FA. Chairman Malcolm Struhl included a very hard-hitting article about the Welsh FA in yesterday's match programme and is known to be upset that an appeal against manager John Toshak's four-month touchline ban and a request of financial compensation for players on international duty for Wales were both turned down flat. So Mr Struhl has stated, we are considering disaffiliating from membership of the Welsh FA. If we take that drastic step, we will apply for membership of the Football Association. There's some good news today for all Newcastle fans. Manager Arthur Cox told me that Kevin Keegan is all set to sign a new contract which will keep him at St James's Park for another year. Despite a lowly league position, Newcastle are ninth from bottom of the second division, and that unlucky exit from the FA Cup last Wednesday, Kevin has made it clear he loves playing on Tyneside and that's why he's staying. There's a new role in store for Alan Mullery. This week he will become the latest director manager of a football club when he joins the Crystal Palace board. Alan took over the manager's job at Selhurst Park last June. The European champions Aston Villa fly off tomorrow for Wednesday's Super Cup first leg match against Barcelona. Manager Tony Barton tells us he has no real injury worries and that Gary Shaw, who's been out with a damaged hamstring, trained yesterday morning and will be available for selection. There was one fourth division match played this afternoon and Scunthorpe's 3-0 win against Hartlepool takes them up to fourth place. Well, that's all for today. Next week's programme is early again at 3.50 with two first division matches for you. Well, let's end with a look again at today's slightly smaller number of scorers. Two of them by players on the threshold of their careers and the third ominously by Liverpool's prolific Ian Rush with 24 goals. He's probably on the threshold of the first division championship. Good afternoon. Hankin, forward for Bell. Beautiful taken by Bell. But suddenly, out of nothing, Pearson scores. Into Johnston. May run for Sunis. Hodgson. Rush is hovering inside the area, and he's there. And Ian Rush.